Well, let's get into our lesson, which deals with the subject as it's entitled, It is False, that one thing is the truth to one person, but false to another. Well, again, one of those things you want to say and scratch your head for a minute and think about what's being said there. Well, let's think about the way that we sometimes hear it. What's true for you may not be true for me. Have you heard somebody say that or something like that? Well, I think we all have. Now, there are matters of preference. There are matters of opinion where somebody might say something along those lines and perhaps it might have a semblance of truth. For example, someone might say, ribeye steak is the best food I've ever put in my mouth. And someone else might say, well, lobster is the best food I've ever put in my mouth. Somebody else might say, Frank Sinatra is the best singer I've ever heard. And somebody else might say, Pavarotti is the best singer that I have ever heard. Well, again, we're dealing with matters of preference here and matters of opinion. But some want to take this kind of thinking and use these types of examples and apply them to every realm, including such realms as morality and religion. For example, one person says marriage is for one man and one woman for life. And then somebody responds, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. Somebody else says lying is always wrong. And somebody else says, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. And somebody else might say, God must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And somebody responds, that may be true for you, but not for me. Somebody else says, you need to be saved through Jesus Christ. And the response that we hear today, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. Now such wide differences in the way it's expressed might make one wonder if there really is such a thing as truth. And so this morning, let us consider this notion, is it true to say that one thing is the truth to one person, but false to another? Let's consider the problem of pluralism. That's what we find among us today. Pluralism is the idea that there are different ways that have equal validity. Singularism would be the idea that there is one right way. But pluralism says, no, there could be multiple ways, contradictory ways, different ways that have equal validity. Along with this go such ideas as multiculturalism, that all cultures have equal validity. Relativism, the idea that truth is relative, what is truth to one person, is different to another person. And all this is sometimes summed up in what is called postmodernism. Some allusions have been made to modernism, which sprung out of Darwinism and spoke, sprung out of the uh, movements in uh, Tübingen and Germany with regard to diminishing the authority and the inspiration of the Bible. But in the modern era, there was the time when you had people who were very antagonistic to the Bible, antagonistic to religion, who would say, we know what the truth is, and you don't have it. And they would say, here is what the truth is. And so they would deny such things as the virgin birth. They would deny the miracles of the Bible. They would deny the inspiration of the scripture. They would deny the creation, saying that we are a product of evolution. That was modernism. And then we then speak about postmodernism and says that's what has followed this. And so instead of them saying we know that the Bible is false, they say you cannot know the Bible is true. And this is what we find as being the preeminent mindset among mankind today. As one professor wrote in a book called The Closing of the, the American Mind, he wrote there is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relative. Relativism. It's true to one person, but not true to another. 
This has been the spring forth then of what is known as deconstructionism, where they think that everything that has been put forth as truth is a construct. It's all a power play. People have set up truth to be power, and so they say language is power, and so they attempt to deconstruct the language. But this mindset is not only found among irreligious people. Pluralism and relativism have deeply infected the religious world. Look at the denominations that exist today. And denominationalism is sinful in its very inception. But at the same time, they have gone further and further. Debates, for example, were things that would oftentimes take place between gospel preachers and denominational preachers. When's the last time you've heard of a debate taking place between a gospel preacher and a denominational preacher? Well, why do debates not occur anymore? Well, because they do not get offended in the way they did in times past in the sense of saying, well, what you're preaching isn't the truth. They'll say, well, that's just their truth. Let them have their truth because we're going to go on with our truth. And we don't want to be so naive as to think that pluralism hasn't infected the churches of Christ. It most certainly has. There was a sermon that was commonly preached in Churches of Christ 50, 60 years ago, which was entitled something along the lines of, Preach the Gospel and Leave Everyone Alone. Now, you need to understand that this title was ironic. Nobody was really saying just preach the gospel and leave everyone alone. The point was it was showing that it was altogether impossible to preach the gospel and leave sinners to feel uncomfortable, to feel comfortable in their sins. When the gospel is preached, people are going to be pricked in their hearts. They're going to be cut to their heart. That's what we see taking place when the gospel is preached in the book of Acts, and that's what will take place when the gospel is preached today. But some years ago, I was having a discussion with a <clears throat> gospel preacher in New York City. And we were discussing the idea of instrumental music and worship. And he was telling me how he preached the subject was that a cappella is a wonderful way to worship. He would not condemn instrumental music in the worship. Folks, this is postmodernism. This is pluralism. This is relativism. Saying it's okay to do it in another way if that's what you think you want to do. There was a book written called The Crux of the Matter, and it was written by three faculty members of the Graduate School of Theology at Abilene Christian University. And this book makes the claim with regard to the churches of Christ. It says, we must be less rigid about our traditional stances to meet the needs of the current culture. And so be less dogmatic on standing and saying, this is the truth. You need to be more flexible. Goes on to say, constantly changing human conditions demand a constantly renewed approach to Scripture. Again, we think about what Brother Litke said during his lecture and how there is truth, and we reason properly, and we draw the conclusions as are warranted by the evidence. Why would we change that? Are we saying let's draw conclusions that are not warranted by the evidence? Let's look at different evidence beside that which we find in Scripture. But if everything is relative, that really defeats our purpose for being here. That really defeats the purpose of the church's reason to exist. In Proverbs 16 and verse 2, we read, every way of a man is clean in his own eyes. And that's what we find today. People think that they're fine because their way is right, because their way is truth, or at least it is to them. And that's the problem that we find today, the problem of pluralism. But let us consider then the motives behind the misconceptions. 
Let there be no mistake about it. There are motives behind this. It's not that somebody said, well, that's just the way it is. I'm going to draw conclusions based upon the evidence, and I'm going to decide that truth is relative. No, there are motives behind it. In John 3, in verse 18, we're told why people rejected Jesus Christ. Jesus came as a light into the world, according to John chapter 1. But we read that men hated the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be manifest. We're told in John 3 in verse 18. Well, I won't get into it. Brother Stolting talked about it last night. The relationship and the equivalence between the light and the truth, they are one and the same. Where there is light, there is truth. Where there is truth, there is light. It illuminates the way. But Isaiah 5 and verse 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They call the evil good and the good evil. They call the darkness light and the light darkness, and so they've changed the terms. That's the deconstruction that's taken place of the language. And so what people knew was good, what people knew was moral, now they're saying it's all relative, it doesn't matter. When Jesus was speaking to Pontius Pilate, and he made the statement, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Again, people who are willing to change their ways, they're going to come to the truth. They're going to come to the light. But what did Pontius Pilate say? He said, what is truth? He wasn't willing to debate the notion. He wasn't willing to come and let us reason together, Isaiah 1 and verse 18. He just diminished it offhand. What is truth? It's all relative between different people. I'm a Roman. You are a Jew. You talk about Jewish things. I'm going to deal with Roman things, and I'm going to mind my business, and so you deal with yours. And that's what we find today. And so you find these misapplications that exist with regard to various scriptures. You hear these many misapplications such as Matthew 7 and verse 1, which somebody who doesn't know the Bible, if they can quote one verse or at least paraphrase it, this might be the verse that they can paraphrase or quote. Judge not that you be not judged. Or along with it, let him that is without sin first cast the stone. One of those, they'll, they'll misapply this and they'll use this all the time. And so to say that one way is right and another way is wrong, well, they say, you're judging me. And so you are a hypocrite because you're violating your own scripture. Again, a misapplication of what's being said. But they'll misapply Romans 14. We spoke about matters of judgment before, matters of preference, but Romans 14 makes the statement, Who art thou that judgeth another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. To his own master he standeth or falleth. And so you say somebody is teaching something that's false. That's not true. You need to change what you're teaching. You're practicing something that is sinful and immoral. You need to change these practices. To my own master I stand or fall. Who are you that judge an other man's servant? Who are you to do such things? Again, this is taking things out of context. Matthew 7 verse 1, Judge not that you be not judged. Well, the very passage goes on and says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. That is, there is a standard of judgment. And so don't be hypocritical. Later on in that same chapter, it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And by their fruits, you shall know them. You should be able to decide and judge that this is a false teacher based upon their fruits, based upon what they teach, and so that is a judgment that you need to make. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. John 7, 24. And so there are judgments that must be made. And again, Romans 14. 
And speaking about the idea, well, there are some who would eat meat and some would avoid eating certain types of meat. And there are debates as to exactly what this centered around. Perhaps it might have been Jews who still had some type of conscience compulsion with regard to the old law and wanted to avoid certain types of meat. But others did not see a problem with it. Well, the point being made is don't condemn somebody because God's word does not condemn it. That is the problem. If God's word condemns something, we need to condemn it. If God's word commends something, we need to commend it. We need to stand with God. But we see these motives behind it. And really when they're saying, don't judge me, is saying, I want to go on and keep doing what I've been doing. I want to stay comfortable and what I'm doing, I want to stay in my sin, and I don't want anybody to tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. That is why we've had the arising of pluralism. But we look at what's actually been taking place more recently, and it's really becoming all the clearer. Because really, we have been crossing over in the past decade from the postmodern era of pluralism and relativism into what we might call the post-postmodern era. That is, a new orthodoxy has been established. There is a new truth that has been set up, a new God that has been erected before whom we are all supposed to bow. In Psalm 11:3, the question was asked, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Well, we found decades where the foundations were being destroyed in secular universities, followed up by Christian universities, followed up by the secular world, and into the religious world. The foundations were being destroyed. But those forces who sought to destroy the foundations did so so they could replace them with their own foundations. Does anybody really and truly believe that one thing is the truth to one person, but false to another. That's ludicrous on the face of it, isn't it? By the very idea of what truth is. Do people really believe that there is no such thing as reality? Do people really believe there is no such thing as fact? We are seeing now that the whole undermining of truth had more behind it than giving equal validity to false notions. Now, we are expected not to find homosexuality just tolerable, but we are now to embrace and accept it. Now, if you say that homosexual marriage is wrong, you are going to be scorned and derided. It wasn't all that long ago that you'd hear of people in the homosexual community saying, we don't believe in homosexual marriage. We just want some type of civil union. We just want some level of tolerance for us to live in our chosen lifestyle. But look at what's gone on. Now we have marriage and everybody's expected to accept this idea of homosexual marriage. And you look at what's taken place recently with the national media and how they've been blowing their top over as one headline put it, Vice President's wife Karen Pence to teach at anti-LGBT school. Again, by the way, how many of you had ever heard the expression anti-LGBT 10 years ago? I, I, we had never heard this acronym before. And now everybody knows what this is. And all of a sudden, anti-LGBT is the worst thing that anybody could be. You are a bigot. You are an intoler you're intolerant. You are as bad as a racist if you're opposed to this type of living, if you condemn it as wrong. But why is the school at which Mrs. Pence is teaching or has taught, I assume she's still there, why is that school so awful? Well, it relates to the fact that it prohibits its employees from engaging in certain types of, quote, moral misconduct. And uh, one CNN commentator 
uh, Clay Kane, indignantly raged, quote, it identifies, that is their policy, was saying it identifies moral misconduct that would disqualify employees as premarital sex, cohabitation, extramarital sex, homosexual or lesbian sexual activity, polygamy, transgender identity, any other violations of the unique roles of male and female. This language is disgusting. And obviously that last sentence was Mr. Kane's own commentary on this pretty even-handed policy. Again, it's not singling out just homosexuals. It's speaking about other types of truly moral misconduct, immoral activities, sexually immoral activities. But they say this language is disgusting. Not it's a different view of truth than we have, but it is disgusting. It violates our orthodoxy. It is wrong. And so we have this new truth that has been established. This is what's been going on the whole time. All this undermining was to set up this new type of truth. Now that said, you will still find people who will use this pluralism, this relativism, as a little escape hatch, a little get-out-of-jail-free card when they need to use it, when they're confronted with facts, when they're confronted with reality, when they're confronted with logic and reason. Then they will pull that little card out it when they need it. But the point of postmodernism was never to get at the truth. That wasn't the idea. In textbooks, pushed this for decades, and you could read what they were saying in their textbooks, that we cannot really get at truth. They would say, here we are. Here's where mankind is. And some might actually believe that there is truth over here. But there is this fog. There is this haze. And perhaps at times, we might be able to move over here so we can see a little something blurry. Might not be quite able to make out the distinct outline of it, might not be able to make out the distinct color of it, but there it exists. That's what they were saying. But the whole point was so they could be behind the scenes reshaping what the new reality, what the tr new truth was to be. They saw it as power where truth had existed. And so now they have set forth their claim of power because they have set forth a new type of truth. But what they were trying to do and what they still try to do is try to rob us of our certainty. I was watching a debate a couple of years ago between an atheist and somebody who was a professed Christian. And this atheist was making the statement to the assembly, and he was in the affirmative. And so he was supposed to be affirming his proposition, which said, I know that God does not exist. But he made the statement to the audience, he said, my job is to confuse all of you. He actually didn't say it quite so nicely, but he said, my job is to confuse all of you. My job is to put a big haze in front of you so you don't know what the truth is. Well, at least this debater was honest about his dishonesty. He was honest that he was putting a big smoke screen up in front of everybody because that's what postmodern and pluralism is sought to do. Many college professors boast about how they undermine their students' beliefs. They try to discredit everything that people have believed, not by showing forth what is any type of real truth, by just confusing them. And so we have the actual truth having been re replaced by a new truth while the smoke screen of postmodernism has been there. Now, it is true that one thing may apply to one person, but not to another. For example, we read in 1 Peter chapter 5 that elders are to take the oversight of the flock. Does that apply to me? Well, I, I'm not an elder, so that does not particularly apply to me. We have instructions that are given to particular people. But we find people who choose to reject truth because they don't want it. They don't like how it rebukes them. There are those who are guilty of moral laziness. 
There are those who are guilty of spiritual laziness. And that's why they have professed to have misconceptions about the truth. But we need to realize that truth is, by its very nature, objective. What do I mean when I say objective? Well, objective is defined as not influenced by personal feelings or opinions in considering and representing facts. And so just allowing the facts to stand as they are. I'm not changing things. I realize that there is a certainty out there. And so we realize that if there is this truth, it is objective, and that anything that contradicts truth must of necessity not be an other truth, but must of necessity be false. Again, we consider what we said before, you know, lying is wrong at all times. Well, that may be true for you, but not for me. We read in Proverbs 12 and verse 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord. Is that true? It is true. So it's, it's okay to lie every now and then to make that statement is false, and it is false to everyone. That is universally applicable. And the idea that truth is a construct. No human being is at liberty to construct truth. No human being. We might be able to discover truth, we might be able to express truth in a certain way. You know, somebody might say, well, Lee, you just constructed truth yourself when you said no human being is at liberty to construct truth. Well, whether or not anybody has ever expressed it in these exact terms, this truth existed long before I was born. No human being is at liberty to construct truth. We've seen attempts at it. King Saul had been instructed what he wants to do with regard to the Amalekites and their herds and their flocks to destroy them. But yet he chose to do differently. And we read in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 13 what Saul had to say. Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Well, he was constructing a new truth. He's saying what I have done is pleasing to the Lord. And we see this going on all the time in religion today, don't we? God is blessing what I'm doing because there are a lot of numbers. God is blessing what I do. Or we, we, it's always pleasing to God because everybody is feeling edified and good about themselves when they leave. But again, truth is truth. Maybe all the Israelites are very happy with what Saul had done. It seems that he had been able to placate Israelites with his false ideas of worship before. But Samuel said to Saul, after he had said, I performed the command of the Lord, Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? God told you to destroy all of them. Why are they mooing? Why are they bleeding? Why is this evidence right here before my ears? You are departing from reality. You are departing from truth. You cannot construct your own truth. The serpent attempted to construct truth when he said to Eve, Thou shalt not surely die if you eat of the forbidden fruit. Genesis 3 and verse 4. Well, he was constructing a truth, and it was no truth at all. As Jesus said, he was a liar from the beginning, referring to the devil, and abode not in the truth because he is the, lie, he is the murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, for he is the liar and the author of it. He spoke lies. He did not construct successfully a truth. Again, every way of a man is clean in his own eyes. And so we make ourselves out to be right. We make ourselves out to be following what is some type of truth. We're told that the Lord weigheth the spirits. To weigh implies a standard. There's something against at which our spirits will be weighed. There's something against which our deeds will be weighed. And God's the one who does the weighing. 
Again, we think about those statements that were made in the crux of the matter that we looked at earlier, where they said we must be less rigid about our traditional stances to meet the needs of the current culture. Constantly changing human conditions demand a constantly renewed approach to Scripture. Now, if you're not listening very closely to this and not really thinking about the implications of this, you might think this sounds reasonable. But let's look at this a little more closely. Let's change that flimsy wording that somewhat has the smoke screen going on right in the very wording. Let's go ahead and say it like it is. And so let's change it. We must be less rigid about the truth to meet the needs of the current culture. We're going to go along with that. Or how about this, changing this word this way. Constantly changing human conditions demand ignoring the truth in favor of a relevant lie. That's what they're saying. We need to give the culture. We're going to disregard the truth and give people a relevant lie. And that's what it seems the people want these days, a relevant lie. They don't care if it's true. They're not bothered if something is false. If it is relevant, if it is pleasing, they want it. But folks, there is truth. It exists, it is objective, it comes from God, and it is knowable. There are truths that exist that none of us can change. There are truths that exist that every one of us here can universally know. Every one of us can universally know there is a God. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of the God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And so is that a conclusion that we can draw from the evidence? Absolutely it is. How can we have these spheres that go in their orbits? How can we have this order that exists? Since when does chaos produce order? Order produces order. A designer produces design. And as we find being said in Psalm 139, 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The human body is fearfully and wonderfully made. The functioning of the human hand. Robotics have tried to duplicate it. And yes, great progress has been made, but they haven't come to the level of being able to do what a human hand has been, is able to do. And to think about the interdependence of all our systems that we have. However, heart that's pumping blood throughout our bodies, making sure that we are able to live, that all our parts are able to function, and so that blood has to circulate everywhere. But wait a minute, we have a brain. We have a nervous system that has to tell that heart to pump. We have lungs that take in air, that put out the bad air, that bring oxygen to the brain, that bring oxygen to the heart. All of these things are interdependent. Folks, random chance does not produce that. Evolution does not explain that at all. You hear them blathering on and on about the survival of the fittest. Nobody's going to argue against the idea of the survival of the fittest, but tell me how we got the arrival of the fittest. How did we get there? What in blind chance makes some single-celled being say, you know what? Down the line, I'm going to go ahead and develop a nervous system. I'm going to develop a cardiovascular system. I'm going to develop lungs, all these things, and they're all going to come together at the exact same time because if they don't, that being will die instantly. What is going to make that happen so we can know that there is a God? And so we can also know something else. Since there is a God, capital G, we can know that any claims to contradictory gods, little g, are false. We can know that whatever God says is the truth. We can know that whatever anyone says contradictory to God's word is a lie. We can know that God has provided salvation for those who have violated his will. We can know that this salvation is made possible by the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. We can know that God has designated a specific body where the saved are, the church of His Son, Jesus Christ. 
We can know that any so-called salvation that comes outside of Christ and outside of his church saves no one. And since these are truths, and again, each one follows from the previous. If you know the first and you can absolutely know the first, every single one follows and every single one of us can know that. There is no man or woman living to whom these truths are false. Whatever their concepts might be about these truths or whatever notions they might have in their own minds that contradict them, these are truths. Solomon said, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. You see, when we have the truth, we have wisdom and instruction and understanding. But when we live in a world that denies the very existence of truth, what would we find ourselves? We find ourselves ignorant, foolish, without understanding, and unable to be guided. And so let's be certain that we choose to buy the truth. And we have it in God's Word. We have it in the church of His Son. And let us never sell it for a mess of pottage. Thank you.